Hello everyone and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin this morning talking about something that a lot of people in Oklahoma have to deal with from time to time and that is their septic system. Joining us now is Sergio Abbott, one of our soil scientists here at OSU and Sergio you and your team have put together a new extension project mm -hmm. behind us. Mm -hmm. Obviously a series of septic systems. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about the background. Well, um, 40% of houses in Oklahoma have septic systems. And these are houses that are not connected to a city sewer. If you don't receive a, a sewer bill, you probably need a septic system. That 40% um, figure is quite significant because uh, the national average for houses with septic systems is only 20%. So we have a lot of septic systems in Oklahoma, but just like you know, anything that is waste, that's considered waste, we deal with it and we tend to forget about it. So this facility is the first of its kind here in Oklahoma and, you know, right in the area. And uh, we want to use this in training the people who are involved in the industry and also to be used as educational uh, facility for kids, for, uh, for high schoolers maybe, even for home, home, uh, homeowners. And one of the questions I asked you was, are you an engineer? and you are actually a soil scientist. Yep. Talk about the importance of the soil in deciding what kind of system you need in the first place and how it's maintained. It, in all of these systems, uh, the ultimate recipient of the waste, the, treat, the one that treats the waste, is actually the soil. And rules in Oklahoma um, as, that pertains to septic systems is largely dependent on the soil. So the decision as to what system needs to be installed in the area is, is largely dependent on what type of soil, what is the thickness of the soil, and how effective is that soil to, in treating wastes. Okay, and I know I'm a novice, but typically these are all underground, correct? These are, these are not underground, yes. But for educational purposes, they're above ground? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. We want uh, people here to actually touch it, see it, then of course look inside the tanks and walk around it and have a good understanding of how they work. Yeah. Let's talk about each of these different models that you have here, starting okay. with this one here. All right. That one right there, that is what we call a, a, a conventional system. Everything is driven by gravity. Uh, that is the most common across the nation, uh, most very common in Oklahoma as well. So if you have perfect soils, good area, thick soils, we rely on gravity to distribute uh, the wastewater across the field. So those pipes are actually underground and they distribute uh, water underneath. Uh, but that's if you have perfect soils. If you don't have perfect soils, we rely on something else to improve the distribution. So we pressurize the system. This is the system right here, which we call low pressure dosing. Pressure is used to distribute the water more evenly. Uh, but not, if none of these would work, and if you have bad soils, clay soils, thin soils, small area, well, we, we rely on you know, even more advanced systems like the one that we have here. This is what we call the aerobic treatment system. Uh, so there's a lot of um, electronics and mechanical parts in it. It's a bit expensive and requires a lot of upkeep. But then again, it allows you to build houses in areas that have bad soils. Like you mentioned, this is, this is something we don't think about until too much until yeah. it stops working and yes. then it's uh, it's pretty much all your attention goes to that. So there must be a real need for training opportunities of all ages, correct? Correct. Um, and um, most of the time, um, problems arise if it's not installed correctly and if it's not maintained correctly. So talking about installation, we have to train our installers to do that, to do the installation in the best way possible. And we also have to train our homeowners that, hey, you have to maintain this and what better way of training than showing them mock-ups of how things work so that we can, we can train them how to properly care for their systems. Tell me about the panels that we see in the back here. Uh, those panels are, um, mock-ups or representations of what, 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 what we have installed in the subsurface. Uh, those, this, this lines right here, they're pipes, they're actually underground, but those are cross sections of, of what we will find in the subsurface. You can see like pipes and around it is gravel, so the wastewater actually moves into the gravel before they will move into the soil for final treatment. And if you have various types of different types of soils, well you will have different types of below ground trenches. So that is basically um, what it represents. Terrific. Well, best of luck as it progresses and, and keep us posted. Maybe we would need a little training too, the SUNUP team. Who knows? Who knows? Okay. Sergio, thanks so much for your time. And for more information on soils and projects like this in Oklahoma, go to sunup.okstate.edu.
turning now to stinging insects and taking away the potential fear in order to look at the potential benefits. Here's extension entomologist Eric Rebeck. Bees and wasps are both beneficial and, uh, and serve as pests. Um, ecologically speaking, they're beneficial from the standpoint that, um, especially with bees, they're pollinators, so they, they're, they're useful in the reproduction of plants, uh, in particular our uh, agriculturally important or horticulturally important plants. They um, also can serve as uh, pests in the standpoint that they can sting. They sting to defend themselves. When they're defending themselves, they're uh, they're either in harm's way or they're trying to defend their nest. Wasps can serve as pollinators, but they're more important in terms of their predatory role in the environment. So they're, uh, this time of year, they're eating a lot of caterpillar pests that might, you might find in your garden or your field. They can also serve in another important role as, as parasitic uh, uh, insects. So they're laying their eggs in or on uh, a pest insect. So we have this kind of dichotomy. They're either predatory or they're parasitic, uh, but of course, like the bees, uh, wasps can also uh, be nuisance pests in the sense that they will sting you. So bees and wasps typically are um, pests in the summertime when there's plentiful food sources around, uh, nectar and pollen from flowers, uh, pest insects they might be trying to uh, use as a food source, and they can be active through the fall uh, months as well until it gets uh, cold enough that they just can't be active anymore. There's no there's no food sources available, uh, so they themselves, again, that those overwintering queens will get ready to uh, uh, bed down, so to speak, and hibernate and uh, carry on that species or that colony the next season. So the rest of the colony will die off. Uh, really, the, when it comes to the biology of these critters, the, the most important uh, members are those that are reproductive because they're the ones that are going to carry on uh, the species later on. These are um, largely, these are social insects, so they have division of labor um, associated with them. So you, the vast majority of what you see flying around are the workers. That's the worker cast. And they're out there collecting the food, defending the nest. Uh, if they're in the hive or the nest, they're tending to the eggs and the larvae that are developing. Um, but it's really those queens that are the most important because they're the ones that um, will contribute uh, their genes and start that colony the next year. Could be tough times ahead for the calf markets. And Daryl, let's talk about how producers can, can negate those prices. Well, we know, you know, margins are going to be under pressure this year with revenues down. At the end of the day, producers never really have a lot of control over the, the, the revenue side of the equation. Uh, we certainly want to be aware of what's happening in the market and plan ahead as best we can in terms of, of how we market these cattle. But the place where we really have the most opportunity to impact margins and to protect those margins in a declining revenue s s uh, scenario is, is by managing costs. So let's, let's delve into that a little bit more. What are some of the costs that, that, that producers can really eagle eye in on? Well, you know, on the one hand, you'd say producers should always be trying to control right. cost, yeah. and that's true, but in, in a different uh, revenue environment, there are changes we can make. Mm -hmm. Some things you don't want to mess with, and so health, uh, you know, health management has to be maintained at all times. Um, the place that's the biggest component of cost is the feed cost, and that's probably the place where most producers can have an impact on, on their margins. And, and in a situation like this, great rains have provided some pretty good forage. We've got forage to work with, and now's a good time to be planning ahead, really, for, for the rest of the year and for next winter. Um, you know, again, the cow is a harvesting machine, and so the place where most producers can really make an impact is by maximizing grazing, taking advantage of that cow as a, gra as a forage harvesting machine. Right. Um, you know, hay relative to supplemental feed is one consideration, but really uh, maximizing grazing to minimize both supplemental feed and hay is, is very important. And, you know, we put some numbers together recently. If you look at the value of pasture rental rates, it translates into a cost for forage of about one and a half cents per pound for every pound of, of, of grass that's grazed by a cow. If you look at hay costs, for example, it's gonna run four and a half to five cents a pound 
uh, under the best of circumstances. So you're talking about a significant savings. If you can extend that grazing uh, you know, season by even one or two weeks, or in some cases by making some changes uh, using cool season forages mixed with warm season forages to extend the front and the back end, uh, you can shave maybe a month up to two months off of the uh, the winter feeding period and really make an impact on the uh, on the cost total cost per cow for the year and and of course it's green right now pastures look great everybody's happy cattle have full bellies but there's always that 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 thought of drought in the back of, of a lot of producers minds what can producers be doing now to prevent or, or, or to uh, to help whenever it does dry up again well, you know, we have to keep in mind that possibility. So we're, you know, we're making hay right now to the extent we need it. We need to plan what those needs are, mm -hmm. but we really need to plan that relative to how we can save pasture. Right. And what we do in the summertime is going to is going to affect both the quantity and quality of standing pasture that's available. And that's true in all environments, whether we're talking an improved pasture kind of a setting or whether we're talking native range. Uh, it's what you do in the summer that's really going to set up your uh, your your forage needs and your hay needs next winter and impact your total cost per cow. Okay, thank you much. Daryl Pill, Livestock Marketing Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. As we go deeper into the summer months, it becomes the time when we may harvest uh, some of those summer annuals that we planted, uh, say, a month or, or two ago. I think it's important that we understand the possibility of a couple of toxins showing up in stressed plants. These summer annuals, such things as millets, uh, sorgo sudans, sudan by sudan hybrids, sorghum sudans, even Johnson grass would fall into those categories. The two toxins that I'm concerned about are, are nitrates and prussic acid. And they're very, very different, even though stressed plants will have the chance to cause either one or both of those situations to arise. In the case of nitrate, it is a salt that actually is accumulated in the plant where the plant has taken up a lot of nitrogen out of the soil, but because of the stress situation it's, it's in, it hasn't been able to metabolize that nitrogen on into plant protein, and it accumulates as nitrates. We want to remember that uh, if we have uh, actual nitrates showing up in some of our plants, that if we cut it and harvest it, it's still going to be there next winter when we feed it. Now that's a little different from prussic acid. Prussic acid, uh, the uh, a compound that causes the problem, uh, hydrocyanic acid, actually is in the form of a gas that once the uh, cell walls of the plant are broken, and that can occur if the plant is harvested and allowed to cure rather thoroughly, then a good deal of that gas will escape into the atmosphere and no longer be uh, uh, certainly in as high a concentration. So understanding those two differences I think is very important. That cutting the crop will not solve our nitrate problems. Cutting the crop and allowing it to cure thoroughly will reduce the risk of prussic acid poisoning. We can never say it totally eliminates it, but certainly can reduce it uh, rather dramatically. That means to me then that if we're going to uh, go ahead and cut this for hay sometime in the future, we probably want to test for the nitrate concentration in these plants before we actually run the mower out here and put it in the windrow. We can stop by our local county extension educator and visit about uh, sampling techniques, testing techniques, uh, some of the uh, extension offices will have those field kits that uh, can come out and take a look to see about the presence or absence of high nitrates in the forages. And if we're uh, still having questions about it, we can go ahead and get a sample of the forage, send it off to the uh, OSU uh, Water Soils Forage Testing Laboratory here at Stillwater and get a quantitative or a look at the actual amount of concentration in those plants. In the case of prussic acid, there are also some field tests available. 
And uh, I think we want to remember that if we're going to get a sample and send into the diagnostic lab for testing, that has to be done very, very carefully because of the fact that it's a gas, it can escape, and you want to do that sampling according to the directions that you would get from the county extension educator. Test the forage before you cut. That way we're not in that situation where we've already put in the bale something that's toxic and is very, very difficult to handle and to feed. I hope that you'll go to the SUNUP website. That's sunup.okstate.edu. We've put a couple of show links up there. One, uh, a fact sheet about nitrate toxicity in livestock. It's fact sheet PSS 2903. There's another fact sheet there on how to take a good forage sample to send to the, to the laboratory. Both of those will be real helpful to you this summer as you put up a good feedable hay crop for your cattle this winter. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. Kim Anderson, our crop marketing specialist, joins us now. And Kim, wheat prices in the tank, below the cost of production, and below the government loan rate in a lot of counties. Do you have any good news for us? I think there is good news out there. You look at the hard red winter wheat harvest, it's cleared Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, uh, Colorado's uh, pretty much through, get it, getting up into Nebraska. So I think we've got this harvest mostly in the bin. I think the big above uh, production expectation is done. There may be some questions about uh, Nebraska's crop. It may not come in as good as they uh, earlier uh, anticipated. Our protein was below average, but the reports I get from tests that it's a good quality milling protein and that right now the hard red winter wheat crop in the, in the bin is a good buy uh, for millers. Uh, you look at the funds, uh, they're short over 100,000 contracts. That's over 500 million bushels. In other words, they've sold about a third of, the, of this year's crop and they've got to get out of those short positions sometime. And when they do, I think prices will come up. And you look at that uh, KC September uh, wheat contract, it hit $4. It's back up right at that uh, $4.30 used to be support, now resistance. If it can cross that $4.30, I think we've got a little more room to run in pro with prices. So in terms of prices, do you think they truly have bottomed out now? I do think they bottomed out. Uh, I just can't see much coming down the pike that's going to surprise us. Uh, you look at this uh, WASD uh, report that came out this week. They lowered uh, the 16, 17 uh, world ending stocks estimates. The world stocks to use uh, uh, ratio is below average, so we've got good demand for it. Uh, you look at France, uh, they've had too much rain there. Their quality's down, their yield is lower. Argentina's had trouble planting the crop. Low prices, I think, or will will lower uh, plantings for the southern hemisphere uh, wheat crops and looking at the 17 crops. We got a lot of wheat being fed. I think that's good news and we're getting support from corn prices and corn prices have been moving up. So I'm, I'm uh, semi-optimistic right now. Okay, I'll take semi-optimistic. Now with all of this in mind, what should producers keep in mind between now and June 2017? Well, what they've got to have is a plan to sell this 16 crop. I know prices are in the tank. I know it's a sad situation but they've got to have a plan on how to sell that. I think they need to look at using the loan and and extending their time that they can that can take risk further out. I also think they've got a plan for the 17 crop. We got really good. You're talking about 12 uh, percent protein wheat, 85 cent premium there. I think that premium is going to be there in June of 17. I think producers need to look at producing protein, concentrate on protein next year. They've got to look at the discounts for the mater for material and dockage. Work at producing a high quality 17 crop and it's going to make up for some of these low prices. Okay, thanks a lot Kim. We'll see you next week. Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mezzanine Weather Report. 
With the rains tapering off as we plod through summer, we start thinking in terms of what are meaningful rainfall events. One of the ways to look at rain is to look at how it impacts soil moisture. A map of the change in soil moisture 10 inches deep from July 5th through July 12th shows where soil moisture improved the green areas and where moisture dropped the brown purple areas. Those changes in soil moisture corresponded to areas on the Mesonet seven day rainfall map like Altus with two and 56 hundredths inches of rain and a four tenths increase in soil moisture reported as fractional water index. Ada's soil moisture plummeted by seven tenths. Ada had only a spit of rain over these seven days, three hundredths. Next door, Centrahoma collected two and ninety-one hundredths inches of rain and had a three tenths increase in soil moisture. The water our plants draw from the soil can be monitored with the potential evapotranspiration maps. On Tuesday, July 12th, potential losses for turf range from four tenths inches of water in the dark brown areas to two tenths in the dark green areas. Here's Gary with a check on drought and a look ahead. We are still dealing with that uh, bad color on the drought monitor. So let's take a look at that map. So this week's map released on Thursday, we saw that uh, we still have moderate drought listed from around Canadian County and now it extends all the way over uh, to east of Tulsa and that yellow area which means abnormally dry conditions the precursor to drought continues to expand especially across eastern Oklahoma as that area goes without significant rainfall and also deals with uh, summertime heat the perfect conditions for flash drought and that's exactly what we're dealing with from the Climate Prediction Center, this is for July 18th through the 22nd, we see greatly increased odds of above normal temperatures across most of the U.S., but especially across the central U.S. Uh, that's that heat dome. And then we also see associated with that uh, increased odds of below normal precipitation. So unfortunately, starting next week, we're right back under the flash fire. Uh, and all the bad things that come with that. So nothing shocking here. The heat dome's going to be over us. We're going to be hot. We're going to be dry. It's summer in Oklahoma. We just have to hope that we get some uh, intermittent showers to help relieve that until we can get some real rainfall in here uh, later this summer into early fall. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Oklahoma City now to see how a favorite family recipe has turned into a successful family business. Here's SunUp's Dave Deacon. I'll say come on down. Kids love it. They like it on all kinds of pastas and fresh vegetables and I like that because it's something healthy for them. She's talking about Diane's signature products that she and Cameo make right here at the Oklahoma Refrigerated Services Commercial Kitchen. And they bottle it by hand and foot. And that secures the cap. Isn't that just the most fun thing? We all fight over who gets to do this. Diane made her dressing at family events and after many years of perfecting it, they had the opportunity to start selling it. She said, okay, mom, now what's the recipe? And I said, well, I don't know. You know, I just know. You pour a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and it took us six months to refine it. <laughs> and that's where Jim Brooks came in. There has been quite an extensive work, a lot in product development for what they're doing now. Uh, reformulations, uh, nutritional information, shelf life test studies, uh, you know, things along that line to continue to improve and keep the quality that they want to keep. First thing he told us was get a co-packer. But that's not how everyone does it. And every time we did interview a co-packer, there was a problem with our ingredients. I don't want to use this, I don't want to use that, it'll be so much faster, blah, blah. So we said, you know, that's not why we got into this. So here we are. Well, I love her. And people do. Diane's signature products are sold in stores in Oklahoma and Texas and online around the world, especially the ones with the hatch peppers. 
a local vendor like Diane, I mean, you just can't beat her. Um, and her product is, is phenomenal. She has um, been able to, I think she started sampling here at our store about a year ago. We do a hatch event, a uh, hatch pepper event every year. And she has a dressing that is hatch pepper dressing. And oh my goodness, it just was a marriage made in heaven. Um, she was able to showcase uh, her product and get a following. Each bottle is handmade by two ladies from a family recipe. It's something we can leave behind that was a part of us, a big part of our whole lives. I mean, our kids have come down and helped us label. They've uh, helped us load trucks. They've, you know, they've done things periodically um, all through the process. Um, <clears throat> so it's kind of a, a legacy. You know, we want to leave something behind for them and um, something that they can build on and maybe it'll be a part of their lives or bring them some extra joy or happiness or allow them to do something they couldn't do otherwise. That'll do it for us this week. Remember you can find us anytime online at sunup.okstate.edu and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone. And remember, Oklahoma Ag starts at sunup.